Good morning, everyone. Again, uh, interesting way to spend uh, your Saturday. Uh, Mary mentioned, I, I am one of three lawyers who will be speaking today. I'm really setting the stage by really talking sort of powers of attorney 101, the basics that everyone really needs to know. My situation's a little different than the lawyers that are speaking this afternoon. I work for Scotia Trust. The other two lawyers are actually in private practice. One uh, focuses more in the planning area, and Mark Handelman works for a firm that works in the litigation area. And also interested to see there is someone speaking from Ayrshire this afternoon, and that is an organization that actually provides insurance to people who are acting as what we call a fiduciary, as an attorney or an executor. And I think that's maybe a very good starting point. If this is a job, if you're thinking of being an attorney or an executor for which you may want to think about taking it out insurance, that tells you something about the role. So again, very much the basics that I would like to go through that I think will set the stage nicely for the rest of the day. We're talking about powers of attorney today, but these should not be seen in isolation. They really are part of a larger estate plan. And this graphic is how I think of estate planning. If you think of a spider's web, if you were to touch any part of that web, it's going to reverberate throughout the web. So these are all of the things that people should be thinking about. Your will and powers of attorney are definitely the cornerstones of your estate plan, but all of these other elements come into play as well. And sometimes where people get in trouble is by looking at them in isolation. So things like making beneficiary designations on RSP, RIF, or life insurance, you need to make sure that that doesn't contradict what you're saying in your will. Some people also need to be concerned about potential claimants for their estate. So in Canada, we have a system known, it's testamentary freedom. So essentially, you're able to leave your assets wherever you want. And that's unlike certain other jurisdictions that have what is known as forced airship, where there are laws which say where your assets must go. But that is subject to certain people may have a claim on your estate. The most obvious one would be minor dependent beneficiaries. Spouses are the other group that may have a claim on your estate, but it can extend beyond that. You may have a, a marriage contract where there's an ex-spouse who might have a claim. You might also have adult children who are in fact fin financially dependent on you. They might have a claim. And certain provinces, BC being the most obvious, has gone further and they've essentially said parents have a moral obligation to benefit even adult independent children. So if you were in British Columbia to choose not to benefit one of your children, and there's been cases where daughter was estranged from her dad, you know, doesn't matter the reason why, but they hadn't spoken for 40 years. She was on her own, completely independent of him. She made a claim under the will's variation provisions. She was given um, a percentage of his estate. That so far would not happen in Ontario, but the point is you need to be aware of potential claimants. Another thing to be very, very careful of, and it could be a seminar on its own, is making assets joint with anyone other than your spouse. There are lawsuits galore on this. People tend to, I, I think of it as a shortcut and a dangerous shortcut. People tend to do it strictly to try to avoid probate, and there's a lot of um, things you need to watch with that. And I can speak with people uh, maybe under uh, questions about that later. So again, the cornerstones of your plan, your will, your power of attorney. So again, very basic. Your will specifies what you want to have happen to your assets when you die. Your will has no force or effect during the time that you're alive. Nobody can do anything with your will. And you are able to change your will at any time so long as you still have the capacity to do so. And there are actually tests set out at law as to what that level of capacity is. And interestingly, there is not one test of, not one set standard test of capacity. The test of capacity for doing a will is slightly different from being able to prepare a power of attorney. Um, interestingly, there's also uh, threshold capacities for getting married and other things in life. But you really, so as long as you still have that capacity, you are able to change your will whenever you want. And the reason, and so, power, but your will, again, not effective till you die. 
In contrast, we have powers of attorney, and I'll explain about the two different types in a moment. They are something where you are giving someone authority to act on your behalf during your lifetime, and they cease to be effective the moment you die. And that seems like a very basic point, but a lot of people miss that. Working for a bank, I often hear people, you know, working in the retail branch will say someone came in, they'll say, my mom just passed away, I'm her power of attorney, I'd like to close the account. You no longer have any authority as attorney when the person dies. You may also be named as their executor under their will, and that would be where you would be getting your authority from. So what happens, I often find a good way to encourage people to get moving to do these documents is to explain what happens if you don't have them. And perhaps I'll start with some statistics. There have been, I have been in this business for over 20 years. Poll after poll has shown that about 50% of Canadians die each year without having a will in place. And that just seems to stay constant year, over, no matter how many presentations I do. Lower, only about 35% have powers of attorney in place. So that's one of the things we're trying to address today. So often by understanding what happens if you don't have these documents, it can maybe motivate people to do something about it. So if you don't have a will, it's actually not as serious in my view. There is provincial legislation that says what will happen to your assets. So I'll take my own situation. I'm married, I have two sons. If I passed away without a will, anything that I own jointly with my husband or where he's designated as a beneficiary, he would get that in any event. And all of the first $200,000 of assets in my name, assuming I had that, would go to him. Anything beyond that amount would be shared equally between my two sons. Now my sons are both now adults, the youngest just turned 18, but that would apply whether I left, you know, four and five year olds or 40 and 50 year olds. So again, husband gets the first 200,000, my sons would split. If my sons were still minors, their share would be paid into court and it wouldn't matter how much that share was. This would happen whether they were getting 5,000 or 50 million and worse yet, it would be paid out to them when they attained the age of majority. I've never done a will for anyone who wants their kids to get money at age 18. They usually want to defer that in the will. If I did not have a spouse, then my sons would split everything 50-50. If I did not have a spouse or children, it would go to my parents if they were still alive. In my case, my parents are both deceased. It would then go to any siblings. I'm an only child, so that wouldn't work. It would then go to... Um, in my case, it would go to my cousins. I have two cousins that are living in Canada. Interestingly, and I'm just thinking of this now, I also have some cousins from my dad's side that are overseas in Ireland that I haven't been in contact for, for 40 years. They would also be entitled to a share of my estate. So this is not the situation that I would want. But the point is there is default provisions that say what will happen to your assets and who has the right to be appointed as your executor. There's a hierarchy beginning with a spouse, if there's no spouse, it goes down to children. Someone needs to apply to court to act as your executor. And essentially, your assets would be frozen until that was done. If something were to happen to you, if you were to become incapable of managing either your own financial affairs or personal affairs, and you do not have powers of attorney in place, no one has the ability to act on your behalf. Someone would need to go to court to be appointed as your guardian of property in order to make these decisions for you. It's a court process, it can be time consuming and costly. And what the person needs to do on the financial side, essentially they go through every one of your assets and they need to, put up your hand if at some point you can't hear me, please, I will try to talk a little bit louder now. I'll use my hockey mom voice. So if they would need to go through all of your assets and file a plan with the court for how they are going to deal with them. So I'll take an example. As I'm heading off to do this seminar, my husband was heading off to the nursing home to visit his mom who's in end stages of Alzheimer's. He's her power of attorney. If that document had not been prepared and he was preparing to be the guardian, she still has a condo in the town of Richmond Hill. He would need to file a plan of what he's going to do with the condominium, how it would be maintained during the time it's going to be sold, what are his plans for selling it, and go through any other asset she has, her pension, her RSPs, etc. In her case, it's a relatively simple estate, but what if she had a lot more? What if there was a cottage? 
he would have to explain or state what his plan is for dealing with the cottage, any investments and things like that. So it can be quite a difficult process. On the personal care side, someone again would probably want to be appointed, but we do have default provisions under the Health Care Consent Act in terms of making any medical decisions for you. But again, you have lost the ability to choose the attorney of your choice to make these decisions for you. So simply stated, what is a power of attorney? The power of attorney is actually the document. Sometimes the lingo gets a bit confused. I hear people say, I'm power of attorney for my mom or dad. You are actually the attorney for that person. The document itself is the power of attorney. And again, in this case, attorney does not mean lawyer. The power of attorney, the attorney may be a lawyer, but it, it has a very different meaning in this context. So it's a legal document prepared by someone giving authority to another person, or it could also be a trust company on the financial side to act on their behalf. So sounds pretty simple. So talking first about the power of attorney for property. So again, two types in Ontario for property and for personal care. We have always, as far back as I can remember, had powers of attorney for property. Powers of attorney for personal care were introduced in 1993 when the Substitute Decisions Act was introduced and it updated our old power of attorney legislation. Prior to that, I'm sure many people in this room have heard of living wills. Often, healthcare providers encourage people to prepare these living wills. They were never legally binding. And from personal experience with both of my parents, I can tell you whether they were of any validity or not really depended on the doctor. Some of them said, you know, this gives me some idea of what the person would want and it will guide me. Others said, this really doesn't tell me anything. So we now have the ability since 1993 to prepare the personal care powers of attorney. So starting first with, so again, we have the two types. And again, you can name the same people to act under both, same person or multiple or a trust company, or you can name different categories of people. So the power of attorney for property, and just a little technical for a moment, surprises people to know that traditionally they ended when you became incapable. They were seen more as a document to facilitate business transactions. So it might be I'm in business with a partner and I'm going to be traveling. I need somebody to be able to sign off on a real estate deal or other business transaction when I'm out of the country. That's how they tended to be used. So, and again, when I became incapable, it was no longer of any force or effect. That's, those still exist, but they're used in very limited circumstances. What I'm talking about today are what we in Ontario refer to as continuing powers of attorney for property. Other provinces call them enduring powers of attorney. And what those two terms refer to, it means it continues or endures if you become incapable. And that's obviously what we're here to talk about today, the powers of attorney that they are effective the moment you sign it, but they continue to be effective should you become incapable. Provincial legislation, as Mary pointed out, great similarities across the country, but there are some significant variations. I'm very conscious of this. One of my roles at Scotia Trust is I write all of our marketing material, and there's a brochure sitting on the back table to do with powers of attorney. I have to be able to write something that's at a very high general level, but also addresses all the provinces. So I've, sometimes it's at too high a level because I don't want to get into the specifics, and there certainly are some variations. And where we see that, as Mary pointed out, uh, you might have a situation where the person who grants the attorney lives in one province, the person they name is in another province. People are also quite mobile. You may move. We often get the question, well, I prepared this document in Quebec. I now live in Ontario. Do I need a new one? The answer, it, the answer is it depends. Quite often the bank or whatever um, third party needs to rely on it will accept it, but it's often advisable to get one in the new province just to make things very um, clear and easier to deal with. And again, Ontario, the legislation we're talking about is called the Substitute Decisions Act. So who can make a power of attorney? You need to be 18 or older, and this list is actually taken from the legislation. It's set out specifically in the Substitute Decisions Act. So this is really the test of capacity that I mentioned earlier. And a good estate planning lawyer, if you go to prepare your wills and powers of attorney, will ask you some of these questions to ensure you do indeed have the capacity and know 
the um, what you're granting to someone. So you need to have an idea of what your property is in its approximate value. So you need to know, yes, I have a residential property, I might have a rental property, I have investments, etc. You need to know the people who depend on you financially. So again, you might have a disabled adult child, you may have younger children, etc. You need to have an idea about these. Most importantly, you need to know what it is your attorney has the authority to do. Essentially, you are granting them, unless you put restrictions in the document, full power to deal with all of your assets. They have the legal authority to sell your house, to sell your investments, etc. If they do something bad, such as sell your house and take the money, they could be sued for that, but they still have the legal authority to do it. So you must be extremely careful who you name to take on this role for you. And what I find interesting is we go through, a good lawyer will go through all of this with the attorney, or with, sorry, with the person granting the attorney. The attorney doesn't necessarily know that these are all the powers that they have. And there's also um, one of the things, the last point there, a lawyer will actually say to you, you need to understand that your attorney might misuse or abuse this authority. So they should be very crystal clear what they are able to do. There's actually a section of the criminal code called theft by a power of attorney. So you get your own section of the criminal code, that means there's quite a bit of action. So, so what can your attorney do? This is the authority you're granting. They can basically make any type of decision that you could with respect to your property if you were capable. The only exception is they're not able to make a will for you. There's a slim exception to that exception in New Brunswick, but basically that's the only thing they cannot do for you. Now, this is where I often have people say, well, what if I want to put strict limits on this? You do that at your own peril, because if you become incapable and there's too many limits in there, then you may really restrict what your attorney is able to do. So most times the best advice is to grant full unlimited authority to your attorney and just make sure you've chosen the right person for the role. And I'll talk a bit about how to choose that right person later. So the duties and responsibilities of the attorney, again, I've taken this verbatim from the legislation. This is actually all set out in the act what the attorney must do. So with everything I'm saying today, you should be thinking about this in terms of if you are the grantor, if you're the person making this document, what you should be thinking about. But also, my guess is there's a number of people in this room who are named as attorney and may even be currently acting. You should know what your duties and obligations are, what you've taken on. So again, it's things like keeping meticulous accounts of what you do, making sure that you consult with supportive family and friends, etc. At all times, your primary duty, you are what is known as a fiduciary when you take on this role, and that means you're in a special position of trust in terms of the person that gave you this power. You need always to act in their best interest. And always remember, this is not your money. And I see that. I'll have people say, well, I'm mom's beneficiary. I'm getting it all anyway when she dies. Well, maybe so. But during her lifetime, it is not your money. It must be used only for the person's purposes. Now, I find it interesting, again, most people start acting. They, have an, they might have a general idea of what they're supposed to do. They don't know of this list of things. There's actually been two proposals kicking around. I've heard um, one from a lawyer in private practice who says she sometimes encourages clients to put a provision in the document that says this will only be released to my attorney after they come back to the lawyer and get advice on what their duties are. So it ensures, so again, mom's becoming, in, let's say it was me, my mom's becoming incapable, I want to start acting. I have to go to her lawyer to get the document, and at that time the lawyer will go through some of these things so I know what I'm doing. I don't think that could be legally binding, but it certainly would encourage the attorney to get this advice. The Ontario government several years ago was floating the idea of having all powers of attorney registered with them, and they would only release the document when the attorney again got some advice, and they were going to try to oversee all of these documents that, that I, I just think that would be a logistic nightmare and where I know that everybody in this room knows someone that currently has dementia and there's somebody acting as an attorney just think of what the government would be taking on by doing that so I think at some point there may be some sort of regulation coming into play but we're not there yet so when can your attorney begin acting this is crucial point 
Power of attorney for property is effective the moment it's signed. Your will, as I said earlier, no force or effect. You could leave that laying around if you didn't care if somebody saw it. No one can do anything with it. Your power of attorney for property is effective the moment you sign it. That is true in Ontario. In a couple of other provinces, it's a bit different. They refer to springing powers of attorney in Alberta. They often put conditions in the document that says it can only be used under certain circumstances. The best practice in Ontario, and I believe in most other provinces, is to leave the document clean so that it is effective as soon as you sign it and someone could use it, but you can build in safeguards in another way, and I think this is excellent advice. And here's what we do at the trust company. If someone appoints us, and sometimes we're joint with a family member or it's just the trust company, company alone, we will be appointed as the attorney for property, but we realize the client doesn't want us to start using it right now. We hold it in safekeeping, and we have the client sign a side document. And what that document says is, I understand the document is effective now, but I only want Scotia Trust to use it if. And the first if, first if is the client says, I'd like you to start acting. And we often get that. Sometimes it's, it's for a not so good reason. Someone's ended up in hospital, they're not well, they had a fall. Sometimes it's for a great reason, like they're going to Florida for the winter and they want us to look after their finances. Sometimes we had a woman call once uh, to the trust company and she said, I'm getting old and tired and could use some help. And I think, yeah, you and me both. Anyway, so you could tell us to start acting, that's great. The next one is one or more people tell us to act, and often it's your children. We are not in daily contact with our clients, so it's very important that we have this. So it could be you don't name your children simply because they're either too busy, they don't want to do it, whatever, but they're in contact. They would know when it's time to start acting. So if we got a letter, and often people want to make it a couple of different people for protection, if we got a letter from, say, your son and daughter and said we would like you to start acting under mom's power of attorney, we'll start them. The next one is usually one or more physicians. You could specify your current family physician or you might say whatever physician's care you are under at the time. <coughs> They will give us a letter saying something to the effect of you could use assistance managing your affairs. We will start acting at that time. We like to do this because it's protection for both of us. It lets you know we are not going to start acting prematurely, but it also lets you know that someone needs to let us know when it is time to start acting. And the same thing can apply if you've done this document with your lawyer and you're having your kids act. You can say again to the lawyer, please hold these in safekeeping. I've let my kids know I've named them. They don't need to do anything right now. Please hold this and only release the document under certain conditions. So I think that's a very good way to do it. The reason we don't like to put the conditions in the document is it's very difficult when you then try to use it. So say I named Mary Bart to be my attorney for property and it said Mary can only begin acting when Elaine is mentally incapable. Well, I'm now mentally incapable, say Mary goes to the bank to use it. The bank's going to require proof that I'm mentally incapable. And although, as we all know, a lot of people end up losing their mental capacity, very, very few people are actually declared mentally incompetent. That's a whole different thing at law. So what would the bank, what would a registry office, what would my investment advisor want to see from Mary? You want to keep this as simple as possible. So have the document clean, any conditions you want, put in one of these side documents for protection. So talking a bit about personal care, slightly different thresholds and capacity tests for whom can act. You only need to be 16 years old. And the, uh, so what the lawyer again would say to you is, are you convinced that the person you're naming has a genuine concern for your welfare in terms of making personal care decisions for you? So again, slightly different um, test here. What can your personal care attorney do? So again, we've moved on. These are separate documents. So you've prepared your power of attorney for financial matters. You're preparing your financial, or sorry, your personal care power of attorney. Most people think about the medical issue, withholding consent, granting consent to procedures, putting in clauses like don't take any heroic measures, etc. But it's more than that. It's making decisions about your hygiene, your nutrition, your clothing, where you're going to live. So a good example of how it may work, if you name different attorneys, so for example, say you named your daughter 
as your attorney for financial matters, but you named your son as your attorney for personal care, and the time came to move you or consider moving you into a retirement or nursing home, the actual call would have to be made by your personal care power of attorney. They have the authority. But if someone else holds a financial power of attorney, those two are going to have to get together to see how this is going to work. So one's got the authority, but the other holds the purse strings. So that's something else to think about. I see clients that think it's, you know, their son and daughter don't get along great, so they don't want to make them co-attorneys, but they think it looks good if they name one to do one job and one to do the other. Well, remember, these two worlds are not completely separate. The attorneys may need to collaborate. So again, think about who you're naming in that regard. So how does it work for the personal care? How do they know, you know what to say? If you have made your wishes known during your lifetime, your attorney is legally obligated to follow those wishes and you can put certain specific wishes in the document itself. So we have the more vague things like don't take heroic measures, don't keep me alive artificially. You know, depending on what ends up happening to you, that may or may not be helpful. But very specific directions, and I think the best example I always give, I think it makes it clear, is a Jehovah's Witness that does not want a blood transfusion, they can put that in the document. And that would have to be, long there, you have to be an adult to do this in any event. That is a legally binding wish. So it would actually be battery if someone was to go against that wish. The most important thing is to choose someone that understands and appreciates and really has the same wishes as you. If you know your child or your husband even has a totally different thoughts on what they would like to see with personal care, I would really think carefully about naming that person. So again, any specific wishes, document them and choose someone that you know is going to abide by those wishes because this is obviously a very, very personal thing. What you cannot do, if something is illegal, it's still illegal. So you would not be able to say, I would like someone to assist me in dying, you know, assisted suicide or whatever. As of right now, that is illegal in Canada. So even if you put it in here, it would have no force or effect. So I said the power of attorney for financial affairs effect of the moment you sign it. Different rules for your personal care power of attorney. And this makes sense. Nobody should be able to make decisions for you when you're still able to do it. So, so long as you can make your own personal care decisions, you have to make them yourself. So a doctor is going to speak with you, a nursing home is going to deal with you directly. Only when you are unable to make those decisions on your own can your personal care attorney start acting. They can start acting without having you declared mentally incapable or anything else. So they can just start acting, and if you don't object, they can continue doing so. There is, however, a convoluted procedure. If they start acting and you say, wait a minute, I'm not ready for this, I don't want you to act, that can go through. You can disagree, and, they, um, and there can ultimately be a court process in that way. Sometimes, as you can imagine, it's very black and white. You end up in a coma. You know, it's very clear you're not able to act. Other times, it isn't quite so clear. So again, be very, very careful who you name and choose someone that's not going to abuse this power at all. So how do you choose the right attorney? Well, there is no, there's no one answer for that for people. It depends on a whole bunch of things. The most important attribute for your financial power of attor attorney is honesty. And I heard a lawyer, um, Arthur Fish is one of the top lawyers in terms of incapacity planning in Toronto. I was at something, a presentation he gave once, and he said he was speaking to the client and he, who wanted to name his son, and Arthur said, I was very blunt, I said, is he honest? And the gentleman said, well, I think he is now. <laughs> and Arthur said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, he used to have some trouble with that sort of thing, but I think it's okay now. Well, you know, maybe not. They have a lot of power and there's a lot of potential temptation when you think about what your assets may be. So honesty is absolutely the paramount consideration. And then there's some more logistical things. Do they have the time to do it? Do they have the inclination to do it? If you have several children, you could name them all. Logistically, that might be a nightmare. So if you're choosing one out of a group, remember that they might have to account to all of their siblings. So a lot of just very logistical things come in. If they don't live anywhere near you, legally, they can do what you can appoint them. But again, so my husband's going to be responsible for dealing with my mother-in-law's condo, the contents. If he lived in another province, out of town, even look at how long it takes from getting to, say, Oshawa to Oakville. 
think of just you know be realistic about the person that you name to take on this role you can name multiple attorneys you can have them act what is known as jointly and severally or jointly jointly means they must make all decisions together there's certainly some protection there one of them couldn't go off and do something on their own Again, it might be a bit of a problem logistically, though, if one of them travels a lot and you can't get anything done without getting two signatures. So again, very personal, but think about that. You are definitely encouraged to name either multiple attorneys or at least consecutive attorneys. What we very often see, the business I see in the trust company, if it's a couple, they will appoint each other, but they go on to say, in the event my first named attorney is unable or unwilling to act, I name. So always make sure there's a contingent person in place. If there isn't and your first person's gone, it's as if you never did it. And again, the trust company, and we do have certain asset and age thresholds for getting involved, but where a trust company's involved, they can either act on their own or they could act as a co-attorney with a, um, a family member. And for personal care, again, I mentioned they only need to be age 16 in order to be able to act. Again, the potential for abuse is, and, and the fact some of the other speakers here today will be talking about that, it, it's, I mean, it's very sad, but it happens. It's a very powerful document, and we know that they are abused, and you just need to be aware of that when you're choosing the person to act. And again, I've mentioned the theft provision. I did a presentation on this a few years ago, so this is a little bit dated, but I just started, over the course of a couple of weeks, just looking for some not legal things that I might read, but just in things like McLean's or in newspapers. These are all titles related to abuse by power of attorney. So I'm not sure how clear this is. I'll just read a couple. Stealing from mom and dad. Why power of attorney abuse against seniors is soaring. Concern over power of attorney abuse, elder abuse, power of attorney abuse on the rise, growing crisis. You know, I'm not making this up. This is a huge area right now. And uh, Mary was saying, hearing a lot about litigation, I can tell you that the fastest growing area of law that I see in Toronto is a state in the broad term litigation. And a lot of lawyers are saying the fight used to, kids used to wait till mom and dad died. They at least had the courtesy to do that. They're not waiting anymore. There are so many lawsuits over powers of it. Mom and dad are still alive. They may be out of it. The kids are already fighting. Sad, but true. So what you need to do, let me leave you with some very concrete points. You need to have a valid, up-to-date will that reflects your wishes. When I say up-to-date, some people will say, well, up, you know, what does up-to-date mean? Their wills don't expire. You know, we act at the trust company under wills that are 50 years old. However, you should review your will periodically. And we say, as a rule of thumb, take a look at it every three to five years or if your personal circumstances change. Things like you get married, you get divorced, you separate, you have another child, a beneficiary dies, you move. Those are all the sort of things that should make you at least review your will. It may not need to be changed, but at least take a look at it to see, and again, just every few years. Choose an executor who has the time, time and inclination and expertise to do it. There's a whole lot of stuff to know. Again, I have a law degree. I've been doing this for 20 years. I still see estates where something new comes up. And don't overlook the work involved. Two basic types of wills, what we call outright distributions or where there are ongoing trusts. Where there's trusts involved, the work can actually might run for decades. Even in a so-called outright or immediate distribution, going to take a minimum two years from beginning to end to wrap that up. The probate process is going to take several months, and in most estates you can't begin acting till you have that. You're going to want to get clearance from Canada, Canada Revenue Agency. That's another several months stuck on at the other end, and you should not distribute everything till that is done. So I'm not talking about two years you take off work to do this, but you're on the hook for a couple of years. So again, think about who you're naming. Ask your kids. Kids are a very common um, choice for people, and often people just assume the kids want to do it. Good idea to ask them if they'd like to do it, if they're comfortable doing it. And again, valid, up-to-date powers of attorney. You should review them occasionally as well, primarily to make sure that your wishes are still reflected and your choice of attorney is still appropriate. And attorneys with the right expertise. Most commonly, we see someone, you're looking for the same attributes, essentially, in your executor and your attorney for property. So no rule that you have to have the same person, but most people do do that, and the personal care is generally um, 
Again, you can have the same person or different, but again, the trustworthiness, what you're looking for, people tend to have the same person or people acting in all of the different roles. So I think we have um, some time here if anyone has any questions. Yes, sir. It's just a question in a different way. Um, we have a lot of immigrant population where the language with parents is very difficult. How do you handle that situation where they, you, you talked about you have a discussion, but that person you know, may not be capable of having that discussion? It can be difficult, and it can also... It goes beyond language. It's also a cultural thing. There's certain cultures that sort of verbatim to even talk about death. So it can be very, very difficult. Uh, within the bank, I actually, it, it doesn't come up quite as much as um, you might think. And I think that's because quite often the populations probably go to a lawyer of the same ethnicity, the same language. But where we see it, if we do have a language problem, the bank in particular has a very diverse workforce. So if we didn't have someone within the trust company that could maybe help, we would probably have someone within the bank or we would have connections either just through people that we know ourselves, or I have a lot of connect. The Law Society, for example, would be able to help me find a lawyer that speaks a particular language. So we would, we would not feel comfortable getting involved if the person didn't know what they were signing. So that would be a very big concern for us. We would make sure that we do find someone that can help. Yes. If I'm the attorney with power of attorney over someone who's now incapable, yep. and my situation changes where I'm moving or I'm not going to be able to deal with it anymore, can I then appoint someone to be the new power of attorney with the new attorney for the power of attorney? So the question is if someone has been named as an attorney and they're no longer able to do the job, are they able to appoint a new attorney? So I'll take that in two things. Say you were named and you never acted, but the time comes to act and it's not, you're just not able to do it given your circumstances. You can just choose not to take the role. No one needs to take on the role of executor or of attorney. You can basically turn it down. It is more complicated if you have begun acting. Likely there will have to be a court process to enable you to get out of that job. Quite often the new attorney <clears throat> excuse me, you, they might require an accounting from you because they don't want to get in trouble if you perhaps did something incorrectly during your tenure. So you may be required to show everything that you did from, you know, say January 1st, say you act for two years before the new person can take over. I have seen documents where there are resignation provisions built in, but in most cases, um, if you were acting jointly with someone, it may say that only one person can continue, but if you were named on your own, there may be a court process to get you out and to have the new person brought on. Uh, yes, ma'am. How do you determine that a person, say, that's 95 years old, is either has Alzheimer's or is very mentally alert to change a will at that time? That's a vi so the question is, how do you determine whether someone, the example was given, was a 95-year-old, they may have the beginnings of dementia, or they may be Betty White? Um, how do you determine that? So we begin with, I, I can't not believe that woman, I tell you. Begin with, we, there's a presumption that we all have capacity. So everyone sitting in this room, we are presumed to have capacity. So if I was to go do a will today, I would like to think that a lawyer would not have any doubts about my capacity as we're working through. It would be pretty clear that I know what's going on. I'm capable of doing the will. If I was, and there's not a set age, but 90 would be a pretty obvious one, they're probably going to probe a little deeper. Or if I'm obviously a little, if I'm saying things that aren't exactly right, they're going to delve a little bit deeper. And it's very, the reason it's very interesting is it's both a legal and a medical question. So the test is actually a legal test, but lawyers are not, we're not, there are official capacity assessors out there. So if a lawyer has any doubt, they're likely going to uh, recommend there's a capacity assessment. Of course, the person might be very offended by that, but in other cases, they may like the idea because they want it clear that they did have capacity when it was done so no one can challenge it later. To say it's a very tender area and sort of unclear. I, anyone that's really interested in this area, I participate in a blog called All About Estates, so allaboutestates.ca. 
And it's very interesting. It was set up, I think we're in our third year, and it was um, Justin DeVries, who runs one of the largest estate litigation practices in Toronto, started it. He didn't want it just to be his firm. So he invited, there's a couple of other law firms involved. There's an accounting firm involved. There's a firm that's involved in working with elders. And um, there's also just recently Dr. Ken Shulman asked to join us. And he works out of Sunnybrook, and he is probably the top psychiatric doctor in Canada dealing with capacity issues in the elderly. And he's written a number of blogs on this very topic of sort of how the, he often testifies in court as to somebody's mental capacity. And it's very interesting because they can actually do forensic evaluation. So sometimes the person has died and one of the children is saying, mom did not have capacity when she did this will, it should be thrown out. Mom's already dead. And these forensic psychiatrists actually, by looking at notes and various sequence of events, they can actually opine on whether or not that person had capacity back then. So again, certainly not a black and white answer, but and it really can be a fascinating field. So if anyone's interested, just I, I encourage anyone just to subscribe to this blog. If you know you got the internet, you get it every day. Um, it takes you two minutes if you read them every day. If they pile up, it's a little more. But if you were just to look, you can Google, Google. You can search just under power of attorney or under I've written a lot on this or Dr. Ken Shulman. You could look at his articles as well. Okay, well, that was, yes, Mary. Um, one question that I received yesterday um, on my email, and the question was basically, what if the attorney starts to lose their capacity and the family around them doesn't like what the attorney is doing and thinks that they're yeah. wrong, incompetent, not able to take care of them well, how does that person get fired? Okay, so that's all of these. We're going. You, I'm sorry, but sometimes the advice is go to a lawyer. So let's say there a bunch of things could come up. They could be starting to lose their capacity. It could be they are dealing with the property in a way that somebody thinks is inappropriate. These are the sort of things when somebody goes to a lawyer and says, "Hey, you know, I don't like what's going on here," and a lawsuit or at least sometimes just legal advice. If they're doing something inappropriate and they know it. Knowing someone's consulting with a lawyer may be enough to get them to back off. If not, both sides, as they like to say, lawyer up, and they, they fight it out. But so that, there's, that's actually a very good example of why you need another attorney. If we have, as we know, people are now living much longer, and as someone I know recently put it, we're now, medical science is now live, allowing us to live long enough to lose our mental capacity. I do not think that's a cheery thought, but anyway. So what if, again, very common for husband and wife to name each other. Well, what if you have the 92-year-old husband that's starting to lose, and he's named his, let's make her 94, she had a younger guy, the 94-year-old wife to start taking over all these duties. That might have made sense when they did these documents 30 years ago. You know, I mean, she may be sharp mentally. Does she really want to be going out to the banks and dealing with all of this stuff? So again, this is one of the things you're looking at a, when you appoint the people in the first place, but when you do your review. What made sense 5, 10, 30 years ago may not make sense now. But generally, Mary, and that the, the attorney can die along the way, do something inappropriate. Often there will have to be a court application in order to replace that person. Uh, the first question, uh, and I deliberately don't put this in my presentations because someone always asks a question, but nobody did in the larger group, and I forgot to talk about it, and that is fees. I'm a lawyer, I have to talk about fees. So, starting first with executor. At law, all executors are entitled to take a fee, and the courts like to say they are entitled to fair and reasonable compensation. So what does that mean? What that has evolved to over time through a number of cases is, basically, to administer an estate of average complexity, the executor's entitled to 5% of the value of that estate. We make it more complicated. It's actually 2.5% of each of capital receipts and disbursements and income receipts and disbursements. But if you think of 5%, that will give you a ballpark. That figure could go up or down. Again, you might have a really simple estate. You could have a very complicated estate. 
all, all beneficiaries have the right to challenge an executor's compensation. This is the only product or service I know where courts actually get involved in fees. Everything else is basically what the market will bear. But you can go to court and have your fees approved, or if you're a beneficiary, you can challenge those fees. So a few things to keep in mind. Where trust companies are involved, we like to settle all of this up front so clients sign a compensation agreement with us. So if you were to name Scotia Trust as your executor, you meet with someone, da-da-da, sign a compensation agreement, which is actually a legally binding part of your will. And the way we charge, and this is, I'm speaking for Scotia, but all of the trust companies operate in pretty much the same way. Our top fee is 4.5%. And it goes down. So as with most things in life, the more money you have, the better. Four and a half percent on the first five hundred thousand, four percent on the next five hundred thousand, and it tears down from there. That's a one-time fee. People often say, "Is that every year?" That's a one-time fee. If there are ongoing trusts in the will, so you might have a spousal trust for a second spouse or a disabled child or a minor grandchild, something like that, then there's an annual fee of around 1.5% to look after the trust. Aside from trust companies, most executors don't do this compensation agreement thing, so the fees just come up when you pass away and somebody starts acting. Where you name a lawyer as your executor, and I find that doesn't happen a lot. Lawyers often say, name your kids and tell them to come to me for help. They don't tend to want to be named themselves, but some still will. Then they are supposed to actually run two accounts. One of them for any actual legal work they do. And legal work would include things like, say, your house needs to be sold. They do the real estate transfer. They apply for probate. Those are legal things. But actual executor's work, such as closing your bank account, dealing with the banks and stuff like that, they are supposed to charge based on that sort of 5% thing. A lot of times, if you name an individual such as your child, they're not going to take compensation anyway. But increasingly, I find they are. And where it can get very murky is if there's more than one child. Some, I can think of an example. This was one of the... Um, I learned so much from being a hockey parent. The, the arena once, and a dad's talking to me. He had two sisters. Mom was elderly. First of all, he was her attorney. Then he was her executor. He drove every weekend from Richmond Hill to Windsor for an extended period of time. He said, if nothing else, I'd like to have my gas money covered. But when he went to take money, his sisters were all over him. It was like, you know, this is mom's estate. What are you doing? So if you do name a child and you have more than one and you want them to take compensation, make that clear, either in the will or even in a side thing, because sometimes people feel very guilty about this. And you also need to know if you're the executor and you're taking a fee, that's taxable income. We sometimes see people saying, oh, I want to do it because I want, you know, I can make 20 grand on doing this. Well, it's not 20 grand. You're supposed to report that as income, so it's going to be a lot less than that. So people that think this is a nice way to make some side money, A, they have no idea what they're getting involved with, and B, it's not quite as good as it may look. Another thing to think about with choosing an executor, or, no, sorry, let me finish the fees with powers of attorney. So that's the way it works for your will. Under a power of attorney, the fees are actually set out in regulations to the Substitute Decisions Act, and they're almost identical to what I said about the will. They're actually a little bit higher. Instead of the 2.5%, it's 3%, but there's actual law on what an attorney can charge. You do cannot charge if you are the attorney for personal care. But the property one can, set out in Ontario, different provinces, it's a little bit different. In certain provinces, such as British Columbia, you may not take a fee unless the document specifically says you can. So this is one of the things where it really does vary by province. And in other things you need to think about when you're choosing your executor and attorney, a non-resident is not a good idea. So for your executor, if you name an attorney who resides anywhere outside of the Commonwealth, which isn't something we think about that much, they have to post a bond. So you could have your son living in Buffalo, he'd have a, to post a bond. You could have your daughter living in Australia, she could act without posting a bond. It's just a weird thing. But the other thing, and a, bo a bond is like an insurance product, they have to have some collateral, and it's just protection that everything will be done, government's protection that they will collect the taxes and fees. They're a little leery of non-residents. 
But even just logistically, again, a gentleman asked his son's living in Eastern Europe, you may affect the tax residents, so it could get screwed up in that way. But again, just this is not a job that you can do online. There's more and more things in this world that we can, but you're physically, everybody lives somewhere when they pass away, whether it's in a nursing home that needs cleaned out or in the family home, they've had a cottage for the last 60 years. There's a lot of work to do. You really need someone that is a resident. Okay, I think those were the two big ones that I think were very important to cover, and I'm glad I had um, the opportunity.